Good morning, seventh grade, and welcome to lesson 16, where we are going to continue reading chapter nine from our novel Across by April's by Irene Hunt. Um, we are hopeful to get the middle part of the chapter completed and um, no promises because I am going to time this lesson. So you might hear a timer go off at about the 20 minute mark and I'll try to wrap that up. Um, but we'll see how far we get. So let's take a look at the questions that I'm hopeful to get through in this lesson. You should be able to see these on your screen. So yesterday we completed questions one through three. So we will pick up with question four, which is who was the wild turkey? Five, how did Eb feel about deserting? Um, so I might hint to you the question, the answer for the previous question. And earlier we learned that um, they suspected Eb of, or that he had deserted and of returning back to them. Um, and clearly Eb is a deserter. How does he feel about that? Number six, how did Jethro feel about harboring Eb? And harboring will be one of our vocabulary words. I'm not sure if you've gotten to it yet, but it means to protect or take care of, to hide. Um, so how does Jethro feel about doing that for Eb? Seven, what did Jenny think was bothering Jethro? And then eight, what did Jethro do to solve his problem with Eb? And that is my hope for how far we will get, but we shall see. So once again, I'm going to ask you to get your book out. I'm not going to um, have the, the uh, book up on the screen. I want you to follow along in your book. We are on page 133 and we're starting just below the break of where we left off last time. So please follow along with me. There was an early spring that year. By the first of March, the weather was warm and the higher fields were dry enough for plowing. Jethro carried a rifle with him when he went down to John's place to work. Ellen fretted a great deal about it, but Matt insisted. Jethro had learned how to handle a gun properly and it was always possible that he might bring down some kind of wild game for the table or that he would have need to defend himself against a desperate man. The field he plowed that day in early March was bordered on the east by dense woods, and Jethro became conscious that each time he approached the wood side of the field, the sharp, harsh call of a wild turkey would sound out with a strange kind of insistence, almost as if some stupid bird demanded that he stop and listen. Once, when he halted his team and walked a little distance toward the woods, the calls came furiously one after the other. Then when he returned to his team and moved toward the west, they stopped until he made the round of the field. After several repetitions of this pattern, Jethro tethered his team, or tied up his team, and taking up his rifle, walked into the woods. His heart beat fast as he walked, and his slim brown hand clutching the rifle was wet with sweat. Ed Turner was giving him a day's help in the field across the road, but Jethro chose not to call him, although he had a guilty feeling that he was taking a foolish and dangerous chance. He was walking slowly and carefully, pausing now and then to listen. The call stopped for a while, and he was half convinced that they had actually come from a wild bird. He made no move for a few minutes, and they began again softer now and more certainly coming from the throat of a man. Jethro stood quite still. Hello, he called finally. What is it you want of me? There was no answer. Then the call came again softly, insistently from a clump of trees, one of which was a tremendous old oak, long since hollowed out, first by lightning and then by decay. Jethro walked closer, his gun raised, and after a minute, the human voice, which he had been half expecting to hear, called out to him. Put your gun down, Jeff. I ain't aiming to hurt you. I didn't dast take it the chance at a bed turner hearing me call to you. He thought joyfully of Bill at first. He shouldn't have. Almost every night, he heard his parents talking of Ed and of what uncertainties they would face if he were really a deserter and if he should suddenly appear. But Jethro had forgotten Ed for the moment. The possibility of Bill's return was always a hope far back in his mind. Who is it? He called again. 
come out and let me see your face. Then a skeleton came out from among the trees. It was the skeleton of a Union soldier. Though the uniform it wore was so ragged and filthy, it was difficult to identify. The sunken cheeks were covered with a thin scattering of fuzz. The hair was lank and matted. It fell over the skeleton's forehead and down into his eyes. The boy stared at it without speaking. Now I do wanna pause here because I don't want you to take that literally. There have been students in the past who were like, ooh, a real skeleton? Or that thinking that maybe this was truly a ghost of something and the skeleton is coming out. It's uh, a way of describing how thin he is. He hasn't been eating, that he looks like a skeleton. His skin is so sunken in and that and uh, he just hasn't had enough nutrition for him to look like a real human being here, that he looks more like a skeleton. Jeff, you've grown past all believing. I've been watching you from fur off and I couldn't get over it, how you growed. Then Jethro realized who it was. Eb, he exclaimed in a heart, voice hardly above a whisper. It's Eb, ain't it? There was utter despair in the soldier's voice. Yes, he said. I reckon it's Eb, what there's left of him. For a few seconds, Jethro forgot the federal registrars and the fact that not only the word which preceded Eb, but his method of announcing himself gave credence to the suspicion that he was a deserter. But for those first few seconds, Jethro could only remember that this was Eb, a part of the family, a boy who had been close to Tom, the soldier who would have more vivid stories to tell of the war than ever a newspaper would be able to publish. He held out his hand. Eb, it's good, it's so good to see you. Pa and Ma will be. He stopped suddenly. He noticed that Eb ignored his outstretched hand. Your pa and ma will be scared. That's what you mean, ain't it? Scared for themselves and ashamed of me. He paused for a second and then added defiantly, I deserted, you know. I up and left old Ames Arby of the United States. Jethro could only stare at his cousin. He could find no words. Desertin' ain't a pretty word to you, is it? Well, I done it. I don't just know why. We'd had another skirmish and there was dead boys that we had to bury the next day. And we'd been licked again. All at once that I knowed I couldn't stand it no longer and I just up and left. Once that a man has left, he's done for. I've been a long time getting home and now that I'm here, it ain't no comfort. Eb, couldn't you just come up to the house and see them for a few hours or so? Couldn't you have a good meal and get cleaned up and tell the folks all you know about Tom? I can't. I could get them into awful trouble. Besides, they would probably just as soon not set eyes on the likes of me again. But Eb, if you can't come up to the house, what did you come for? Eb's face showed quick anger. I come because I couldn't help myself, that's why. You don't know what it's like. You that was always the baby and the pet of the family. There be things that are too terrible to talk about. And you want to see the fields where you used to be happy. You want to smell the good air of old Illinois so much that you forget. You go crazy for an hour or so, and then you don't dare go back. He shivered and leaned back against a tree trunk as if just talking had taken more strength than he had to spend. Have you been down to the Point Prospect camp? Jethro asked after a while. A couple days. It's worse than the war down there with fellers afraid and getting meaner as they get more afraid. I didn't come back to be with soldiers anyway. I'm sick of soldiers, living and dead. I'm sick of all of them. He threw himself down on a thick padding of dead leaves and motioned Jethro to do the same. I want you to tell me about him, Jeff. Uncle Matt and Aunt Ellen, Jenny. You knew Pa had a heart attack. He's not been himself since. Ma's tolerable and Jenny's fine. We do the work on the farm together, Jenny and me. John, Shad, where are they? They joined up, didn't they? Yes, 
John's in Tennessee under a general named Rosecrans and Shad's in the east with the Army of the Potomac. He was at Antietam Creek in Fredericksburg. You heard of them two battles, didn't you? We hear precious little except what's happening in the part of the country we're in. I've heard of old Abe kicking out that fine McClellan. It's a pity you don't kick out all passel of them out in the West. Eb seemed absorbed in his angry thoughts for a while. Then he looked up at Jethro again. And Bill, did you ever hear from him? Not a word, Jethro replied in a voice that was hardly audible. I guess you took that hard. He was always a pet of Bill's. All of us took it hard. Your pa wrote Tom and me about it. Tom tried to pretend he didn't care, but I know he did. Cried once it. I wouldn't tell that set now it's no matter. No, Jethro agreed dully. Now it's no matter. Eb took a dry twig and broke it up into a dozen pieces, aimlessly. How did you get the word about Tom? He asked finally. Dan Lawrence was home on sick leave. His pa brought him over. He told us all about it. I was at Pittsburgh Landon too, but I didn't know about Tom, not for two or three days. I wanted to write, but somehow I couldn't do it. Tom and me had been in swimming the day before the Rebs surprised us. We was both of us in good spirits then, laughing and carrying on like we'd done in the old days back home. Somehow, all the spirit in me has been gone ever since. I could stand things as long as I had Tom along with me. He ran his hand across his eyes as if to shut out a picture or a memory. Tell me about little Jenny. Is she still in love with Shad Yale? More than ever, I guess. She writes to him a lot. He sets great store by her letters. He ought to. A man needs a, a girl's nice letters when he's suffering with a homesick. I wished I'd had a girl like Jenny to write to me, but there ain't many such as her, I reckon. Jethro studied Eb's sunken cheeks and dull eyes. How do you manage to eat, Eb? I don't do it regular, that's sure. I live off the land. Steal little, shoot me a rabbit or squirrel and cook them over a low fire late at night. It ain't good eating, but nothing's good these days like it used to be. Jethro's insides twisted in sympathy. Are you hungry now, Ed? I'm always hungry. You get used to it after a while. Nancy fixed me some grub to bring to the field with me. I'll go get it for you. He ran to the fence row where he had left two pieces of bread and the cuts from a particularly tender haunch of beef that Nancy had wrapped in a white cloth for him. Ordinarily, he would have eaten the snack by mid-afternoon, but the wild turkey calls had made him forget it. He returned to Ab minutes later with the food and a jug of water. They sat together in the shadows while Ab ate with an appetite that was like hungry animals. Ab, I've got to tell you, Jethro said quietly after a while. The soldiers that call themselves the federal registrars was at the house looking for you last month. Eb seemed to shrink within himself. He looked at his hands carefully as if he really cared about inspecting them and his mouth worked in a strange convulsive grimace. He wouldn't look at Jethro when he finally spoke. I was an awful fool. At least you got a chance at in battle. Maybe it's one in a hundred, but it's a chance at. This way, I got none. There's no place on earth for me to go. Even the camps of deserters don't want fellers as weak and sick as I am. They let me know that quick at Point Prospect. I'll either freeze or starve or be catched. Caught. <laughs> I'd give just about anything if I could walk back to my old outfit and pitch into fighting again. Soldier don't have to feel ashamed. So, number five, how did Jethro, or not, how did Ab feel about deserting? We got quite a bit in the past few pages, this, but this paragraph really what lets you know. He realizes, I was a fool. He doesn't have a chance. He's so weak. Um, he regrets it. He comments how mom and pa would be scared and ashamed of him. I, He's probably scared and ashamed of himself. 
when you're a soldier, you at least have something to do and something to be proud of, but right now he does not. Let's continue reading at the bottom of the page. Jethro sat for a while, trying to think of some way out of the situation. It appeared more hopeless the more he thought. He was frightened for the despairing man in front of him, for himself and his family. When he finally spoke, he tried hard to sound reassuring, but the pounding of his heart made his voice shake. Well, you stay here till we can think of something, Eb. I'm going to get you some quilts and things from Nancy's place. I'll bring you what grub I can lay hands on. I can always get eggs and chicken for you. I think you best eat all you can and rest for a spell. We'll think of what's to be done when once you get a little stronger. Ed looked up then. You all but fool me into believing that something can be done, Jeff, but I know better. You ne'er, no one else can help me now, not even old Abe himself. And we're not gonna cover the grammar lessons, but what you might remember when we talked about pronouns earlier this year, so he says that word his self, and we talked about how that is not proper grammar, that is not really a word, it should be himself, um, but it was commonplace at that time. Old Abe, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. President. I ought to get back to work now, Eb. I guess so, Eb looked at him with a suggestion of a smile. I can't get used to it. You being big enough to handle a team alone. You seem almost a man these days, Jeff. Even your hair ain't quite as yellow and curly as it used to be. Jethro turned away. I'll bring you a quilt from Nancy's before I go in for the night, he said shortly. He walked back to his waiting team. There was still time to plow a dozen furrows before sunset and to think. He had faced sorrow when Bill left and fear the night guy Wortman tried to pull him down from the wagon. He felt a terrible emptiness the day Shadrach and John went away in deep anger the night he watched the barn burn at the hands of the ruffians. But in his 11 years, he had never been faced with the responsibility of making a fearful decision like the one confronting him. The authority of the law loomed big in his mind. He remembered. You and your family will be in serious trouble. Loyalty to his brother Tom and the many thousands who had fought to the last ditch at Pittsburgh Landing, at Antietam, Fredericksburg, and all the other places that were adding length to the long list. How could loyalty to these men be true if one were going to harbor and give comfort to a man who simply said, I quit? But on the other hand, how did one feel at night if he awoke and remembered, I'm the one that sent my cousin to his death? Ed was not a hero, certainly not now anyway. People scorned the likes of Ed. Sure, so did Jethro, and yet, how do I know what I'd be like if I was sick and scared and hopeless? How does Ed Turner and Mr. Milton or any man know that ain't been there? <coughs> We get to remember that Ed has been in battles for two years. Maybe he's been a hero in them battles. And maybe to go on being a hero in a war that has no end in sight is too much to ask. Sure, deep down in me, I want Ed to get out, to leave me feeling free of feeling that I'm doing wrong to give him grub or taking the risk of keeping it a secret that he's here. Yes, it would leave me free if he'd just move on. But no, it wouldn't. I ain't going to be free when he moves on. I can't sit down to a table and forget that someone sick as Ed looks to be is living off the land, that he's living scared like a wild animal that's being hunted. But what's it going to be like if more and more soldiers quit and go into the woods and leave the fighting to them that won't quit? What do you say to yourself when you remember that you fed and helped someone like Ed? And maybe you get a letter from the East that Shad is killed and you see Jenny grieving, or that John is killed and Nancy and her little boys is left all alone. How do you feel when things like that come up? Of course, right now I could say to Pa, I leave it up to you. And then what could he do? Why, he'd be caught in the same trap I'm in now. I'd wriggle out of it and leave the deciding to a sick old man. 
I put him in the spot where any way he decided would be bad, hurtful to a man's conscience. No. Oh, my timer is interrupted. So I'm going to wrap up this paragraph and talk about it just a minute, and then we'll end our lesson. And what was it that man said the day of the barn raisin? It's good that you're a boy and don't have to worry yourself about this war. Why, yes, no doubt about it, 11-year-old boys ain't got a thing to worry about this year of 1863 is a fine, carefree time for 11-year-old boys. So that last question that we are covering today, let me share my screen real quick. Come on, show me my options. <laughs> okay. So you should be able to see um, question five or six, I mean, how did Jethro feel about harboring Ebb? And these last few paragraphs that we read, just read, he went back and forth and back and forth on both sides of it. So he, he's very confused. This is a terrible dilemma that he is, has been put in. He could put it up to his father, but that's not fair because his father is sick and his father is gonna be, struggle just as much as he is to make that decision. So you have actually only um, three questions again today to go through, four, five, and six, if you would take the time to make sure that those are, are completed, and then we'll move on with the next lesson um, the next time. So I'm going to um, wrap this up for today, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.